But uh, I don't know how long this is going to last, so I may as well sit down. <laughs> you know what happens when you give a professor the stage. <laughs> My oldest brother taught nuclear physics at Berkeley and helped discover the Omega particle. Oh, I know, I know about Welcome that. Welcome to uh, the first frontiers of science of this academic year. My name is Pierre Sikolsky, I'm the Dean of Sciences at the University of Utah. And uh, I'm glad you found us. It's a new venue for us. But all of our frontiers lectures this year will be here at the Leonardo. Um, science to our community. I'd also like to thank this evening's sponsor, uh, Biofire Diagnostics, for their continued support of science education at the University of Utah. I've worked with uh, Dr. Francis Halsen on numerous occasions, and I'm really excited to uh, introduce him tonight. Uh, Dr. Halsen comes to us from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he is the Hill Daniel and Gregory Bright Distinguished Professor in the Department of Physics. And he's also the Director of the Institute for Elementary Particle Physics Research and an ice cube principal investigator. Dr. Paulson is a well-traveled man. He's uh, earned his PhD at the University of Louvain in Belgium, uh, but then worked essentially all over the world at the National Science Foundation of Belgium, CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, Rutherford. Energy Laboratory in the UK, and has held positions in Chicago, New York, Berkeley, Tokyo, Baltimore, and Louisville, Helsinki, and now has. Dr. Halsen uh, was, uh, is a theoretician of note, studying the problems in the interface between particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology, and uh, perhaps strangely enough, wound up leading a team of uh, experimental uh, physicists to study the most elusive particles of nature in some of the most hostile environments on Earth. So please welcome Dr. Francis Halsey. It's a pleasure to be here. I actually came to Salt Lake City the first time in 1974 for a conference. And I must have been back here at least 10 times or more. And it has always been a pleasure to visit this place. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, I am going to tell you about Ice Cube. And uh, I first have to warn you, there will be no beautiful pictures like this. <laughs> this is a picture taken by Frank Hurley, who was a member of the Shackleton expedition. And uh, this is the last beautiful picture you see. Also, there will be no penguins. <laughs> and uh, our story is at the South Pole. This is the South Pole. There are no animals. There's absolutely nothing. The interest to us is that when you stand this place, you stand on three kilometers of ice. And that's the story of this talk. Now, you don't only stand on ice. We found out by accident that this ice is incredibly transparent. In fact, uh, even in a lab, you cannot build a substance that is as transparent as this ice. And the reason is that this ice, at least where we will work with it, is uh, snow that fell on Antarctica 200,000 years ago condensed, and it's ultra-pure. And so the purity reflects in this incredible transparency of this ice. Did we know this? No. We just found out by accident. And uh, if I had known anything about glaciology, you heard from the introduction that I'm a particle physicist and a theoretician. If I had known anything about glaciology, we would never have done this experiment. But, so, this is the same reason, you know, why people 
when they are very young, they make discoveries. When you know too much, you always have reasons not to do something. So I was ignorant about glaciology when I was 50, and so that I started a new career on that. So the message to the young people in uh, the audience is, don't read books, do things. <laughs> okay, so I cannot show you a picture of the ice, but uh, if you go about a thousand kilometers to the edge, uh, this is what the ice looks like. So if you go to the South Pole, you see this is three kilometers high, and so we basically build, we go a mile deep, take a block of this ice and build a particle detector out of this. So that's the story I'm going to tell you. So basically this talk will have no real line. I'm going to have to tell you, introduce concepts to you. So I first have to tell you what a neutrino is. Now, when a particle physicist talks, you then next get overwhelmed with 150 other particles. That won't happen here. You only have to know what a neutrino is, an electron, a proton, a neutron, and a muon. So there are five particles in this talk. All are important. Then I will tell you what neutrino astronomy is, and then I finally tell you what a neutrino telescope is. And that's what we built. It's called Ice Cube. And I will tell you a little bit about the story of building this uh, telescope. I can tell you that the excitement of building this telescope, and actually that it worked, no science we ever do with it will match the excitement of building this thing. And I hope I can convey that to you. And then actually, we actually discovered something as soon as it was finished. And that will be my final slides. So what's a neutrino? Uh, that story always starts with this poem by John Opdyke, which you, many of you have probably seen. And uh, the poem is incredibly good. It says, neutrinos, they are very small. They have no charge, means no electric charge. This is very important, means you cannot see them. You can only detect particles that have an electric charge. They don't interact at all. This is almost true, as you will see. The Earth is just a silly ball to them through which they simply pass, etc., etc. This is a very beautiful poem. You, they always show you the first page of it. I bet none of you have, written, have ever read the rest of it. It's slightly pornographic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't go into it. Uh, okay, we start in high school. Uh, you were told that matter is made out of nuclei and electrons. And nuclei are made of neutrons and protons. And uh, if that's what they told you, you didn't get your money's worth. Because that's true, but there is a fourth particle that's equally important, that's the neutrino. And the reason is that, the reason is that occasionally no, neutrons change into protons. So a neutron goes to a proton plus a positron. That's called nuclear physics. When neutrons change into protons, nuclei change into each other, and that's nuclear physics. However, people found out there's something wrong with this. So here is your, your, the neutron that decays, and these people, Ellis and Mott, in the 30s, found out that occasionally, if I'm the neutron, if the electron goes this way, the proton has to go that way. It's called momentum conservation. They found that occasionally the two particles go that way. That's only possible if some other particles go this way. You have to balance the momentum. So they discovered the neutrino. By today's standards, this is what we call a missing energy experiment. And by today's standards, this is the discovery of a particle. But they had never you know, this was new, and they were uncomfortable. And in fact, Pauli, who interpreted this experiment, said, I have done a terrible thing. I have invented a particle that cannot be detected. <laughs> and uh, I always, while we were building this experiment, which took about 20 years, 
and we were down, you know, when we had many lows in this experiment, I would tell my colleagues, we are going to prove him right. And uh, I was always the only one who laughed. So, I'm a theoretician, you see, I, I can take this. So, neutrinos are everywhere where nuclear physics is. Now, you say, do we care about nuclear physics? Well, without nuclear physics, stars wouldn't die and explode. And we wouldn't be here because the universe is, was helium and hydrogen and everything we are made of is made in stars that explode. Uh, so, the sun is a nuclear reactor, so the sun wouldn't shine. Uh, so, I think you get the idea that the neutrino as a role of the fourth particle that makes up matter, that's very important. Of course, uh, we make neutrinos at nuclear reactors. This is a nuclear reactor here on the right hand side, sitting under water. And notice the water is blue. I'll come back to that. Uh, you and I emit neutrinos. The salt in our body decays and emits neutrinos, quite a lot of them. And we make neutrinos at accelerators. Important for this talk, when you look up in the sky, the atmosphere is a source of neutrinos. And I'll come back later how this actually works. Okay, so conclusion, the neutrino, referring back to the poem, it's very small, it has no mass, no electric charge, so it's just like light, which is important. A neutrino beam is not very different from a light beam, except that it goes through walls, which light does not. And it's a catalyst for nuclear reactions. So, that much for the neutrino. Then I have to talk a little bit about cosmic rays, and I'm here in, uh, you know, the Vatican of cosmic rays. Uh, so, here is a picture introducing the concept uh, cosmic rays are protons, nuclei, that bombard the atmosphere. The atmosphere is made up of nuclei, nitrogen, oxygen, and so you make, when they hit a nucleus in the, atmos in the atmosphere, they make a nuclear reaction that produces particles. And among them there are neutrinos. And among them there are also muons. How do we know this? In fact, this is an interesting story. This man went up, you see I, I, on my previous slide I had a little balloon. These neutrinos are produced at 20 kilometers about. That's how high you can go in a balloon. And that's what uh, this man did. And he went with a simple meter, simple piece of equipment that measured. And he saw the intensity of the particles going up. And so he discovered cosmic rays in 1912. Now, theorists tell them tell us that they are produced in the galaxy by exploding stars and that they are produced in, uh, the outside the galaxy by sources like in that picture. And they will tell you in detail how this works, except there's absolutely no evidence for this. We are now 101 years later and we, I would, when I gave this talk I would say before the 100 years anniversary we will know where the cosmic rays come from. Well, we still don't know. So we keep looking. So this is the picture, the concept I want to introduce. So you see the cosmic ray hitting uh, a nitrogen nucleus or whatever. It produces all these particles and these particles get absorbed in the atmosphere. But you see at the end, only muons and neutrinos reach the Earth and neutrinos go through the Earth. We actually do the ultimate underground experiment. You know, you put detectors underground to see them. We actually just go to the other side of the Earth and look to the sky above Salt Lake City. So that's how we do it. Okay. What do I have to explain next? Cosmic rays. So the atmosphere glows in neutrinos so I'm going to next tell you that we want to do astronomy. And so just like now there are clouds, it's not a really perfect day to do astronomy, but we have to do, to look through the sky, 
which glows in neutrinos instead of light. So we have this, back, this background all the time, and it doesn't depend on the weather, it's there forever. So that will be our challenge. So I have now introduced the, the idea of neutrino astronomy. So how do you do astronomy? Well, you go out at night, it's not dark enough yet, you look up at the sky, and you have beams of light that tell you where the stars are, that travel to your eyes, and you have a detector, which is your eye, which detects light. Now, if you think <laughs> I'm insulting your intelligence by now, uh, it always baffles me. This is actually only known since the 10th century. Before the 10th century, actually, people thought that you see me because I emit light. It's actually the light from the light bulb that reflects from me and that your eye. And this man was the one. And so now I must resist not talking about this man for the rest of the lecture. But notice his three different forms of his name and look him up. It, it, he's incredible. So he lived in the tent. He, he did actually convince, he built a box camera from which he convinced himself that, uh, you know, you saw reflected light. You didn't see light emitted by the objects. He actually uh, hired himself to the caliphate in Egypt to and he claimed that he could reverse the tides of the Nile, which means that you could do agriculture the whole year. So he didn't succeed, of course, and they try to kill him. But so... He wasn't put to death because he pretended for the rest of his life that he was crazy. And during this time, he was a scientist and did all these beautiful experiments. So, uh, that's light. Uh, now, astronomers in recent times have figured out that you could, light comes in different colors. And then if you look at the sky in light in different colors, you see different things. And this has been an incredibly successful enterprise. This is a picture, which you've by now seen three times, I think, of uh, the Crab Nebula. It's a star that exploded in 1054, and that's what it looks like now. It's a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. If you look at the same object in infrared light, and in blue, actually, X-rays, in different colors, you see different objects. For instance, you see in the picture, in the second picture, you can see this beam of particles streaming out of the object. That's never seen until you look at it in X-rays. So also, when you look at the sky, you see objects that you have never seen before. And so, unfortunately, astronomers have been very good at doing this. So they have explored all these wavelengths and all these colors of light. So now the only thing left to do is to change particle. But to change particle, you have to use a neutral particle. And the only neutral particle that actually can reach us from objects in the sky is this neutrino. It has to be neutral because if it had an electric charge, it would interact with the magnetic fields in our galaxy, in the Earth, and it's bent. And uh, once the beam is bent, it comes from all directions and the picture gets fuzzy. With neutrinos, that's not a problem. The problem is to detect them. So then you go and ask for money. And this was my key slide. So you say, well, you know, this tells you, this, this is, you can find this in astronomy textbook. And this tells you how incredibly successful astronomy has been. By the way, I'm Flemish. And the telescope was really, was invented in Flanders. It was invented to, by Martians who looked at the ships coming from England. And if you saw first what was on the ship, you could sell it. And so that was a good business. The one who had the strongest telescope could sell first. When Galileo got his hands on it, he was told about the concept. He improved it because he knew optics and he discovered all these useful things, these beautiful things like the moon of Jupiter. Uh, 
you know all the story probably of Penzias and Wilson who were working for the phone company studying radio backgrounds and discovered uh, the universe. And I like the last line where Los Alamos, they built satellites to look for nuclear explosions over the Soviet Union. They never saw any. I think they saw one from South Africa, but I'm not sure. They turned these satellites up to look at the Vela Pulsar to calibrate it. And they saw explosions like they were looking for in Russia, but they saw them in the sky and they discovered gamma ray bursts, which is still one of the most interesting and unsolved puzzles in, in astronomy. Anyway, and I said, so you know, why we do neutrinos and we joined this list. So, and if you ask for enough money, you end up with administrators. So in the audience was someone of the Office of Management and Budget. I hope you never have to meet these people, but I did. <laughs> and he said to me after my talk, my presentation, he said, you cannot show this. He said, this sounds like... Uh, you're taking a big gamble with taxpayers' money. And I thought, um, it's pretty much what it was. And so I said, what do I do? What do I do in set? He said, here, you show this slide. And that slide I have, I have been showing ever since. So the moral of the story, even administrators have humor from time to time. OK, so you get the idea. Astronomy and neutrinos, uh, so we have to build a big mirror. In fact, square kilometer, this, where the square kilometer comes from, I will not go into. But the history of neutrino astronomy is kind of on the next slide. You already saw that the concept of the neutrino existed since the 1930s. Things don't move fast in neutrino astronomy. If you think it took 20 years to build this detector. That's fast in this field. Uh, so it was in 1956, if you look at the pictures on the left here, in 1956 that Reines and Cowan and their team uh, actually showed that the neutrino was real. And so they did this. If it's difficult to detect a neutrino, if it goes through walls, if it goes through the earth, there's a solution to it. You either build a big detector or you go and put it where there are lots of neutrinos. So they put this detector, which is like this size. It's a big barrel. And in fact, that's what we build. It's just bigger. And uh, they put it close to a nuclear reactor and they saw neutrinos. And it's strange, as soon as they knew, Reines told me, he, he won the Nobel Prize for this, he, he died since. But he told me that as soon as they t knew that the neutrino was a real particle, everybody had the idea to do neutrino astronomy. But between, you know, 30 and 1956, nobody had ever told about it. It's strange how our brain works, right? And so, uh, okay, so you do neutrino astronomy, you build an experiment. But then it was slowly realized that because it's so difficult to detect a neutrino and not too many come from outside our galaxy or even from in our galaxy, from outside the atmosphere, you had to build kind of a kilometer square mirror. So in astronomy terms, you had to have a mirror a kilometer square in, in size. And that means that you build a kilometer cube detector because I will show you de don't detect neutrinos with a mirror. So in 1960, the man on the left in the picture, Markov, had the idea of how to build a kilometer cube detector or at least a very big detector. And so this is how uh, every experiment starts. There's a company in Japan called Hamamatsu and they make these objects. It's a 10 inch, as it says, like this. It, uh, it looks like a huge light bulb. And so what it does is exactly the opposite of a light bulb. It detects light rather than emitting it. So if light strikes this light bulb 
at the, at the back, which is at the other end, an electric current comes out. And a light bulb, the electric current goes in and light comes out. So this is exactly the opposite. Then you take your kilometer cube of water. The first attempt at this was done off the coast of Hawaii. And they went about four kilometers deep. And they never filled anything, but they started by uh, deploying some of these devices in the water, initially very successfully. Uh, and so you imagine a kilometer square of pure water, and then you wait for a neutrino to come through the earth. And uh, what happens is the neutrino comes through the earth and goes through your detector goes through everything. However, at the end, for the neutrinos we are interested in, one in a million neutrinos will crash in a nucleus. You know, there's the hydrogen, oxygen in the water. So if a neutrino accidentally crashes head-on in a nucleus, then it's nuclear physics, like I talked about before. It makes a nuclear reaction, tiny nuclear reaction, Charged particles stream out, they make blue light, and you detect the blue light. So that's the idea. But the idea is actually better than that. And this is where the muon comes in. I have already introduced the muon. The neutrinos and the muons are the particles that make it through the atmosphere. In fact, you know, a, a hundred muons go through this table every second. You're not aware, you don't have to worry about it. One of them, one will interact in your body in a lifetime. And it, you won't get cancer from it. it is, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, so, if a neutrino interacts, you are unlucky. And suppose it interacts just outside your detector. You say, too bad, no. If among the nuclear particles produced is a muon, this muon travels through water for kilometers. And then if the muon reaches your detector, then when it goes through the detector, it emits a bow wave of, bl of blue light. So you can see, you take your sensors that detect light, you measure the direction, the shape of this bow wave of light, the shock wave of light, that tells you the direction of the muon and that tells you the direction of the neutrino. It's all lined up. So you not only detected the neutrino, you knew where it came from. So it could go point back above Salt Lake City here and we would detect it at the South Pole. And so the idea is that you keep detecting neutrinos and so you make dots on a map until the map begins to show pictures. I'll come back to that. It's not as easy as you may think at this point. Okay, I think I told you all that. But so all the physics in this is the blue light that you see emitted when particles stream to water is exactly the blue light you saw in the, in the water covering the reactor. Particles, I mean, it has to shield the reactor, right? So the radiation, the radiated particles that come out of the reactor uh, produce that blue light in the detector. Now, why is the bow wave? Well, you can either look at the top picture or at the picture at the bottom. It's the same idea. Uh, this, this muon travels at the speed of light, but the light itself travels at the speed of light in the water, which is less than the speed of light. So you have a case like uh, the duck travels faster than the speed of the waves on the water it makes. And so it leaves a bow shock like, like a boat that goes fast. And so that's the only physics that go into it. So here is a, is a picture of an event. You see this is, uh, you see the ice cube detector and whenever light is detected it will show a little dot on the screen of colored light. And so you see the, the bow wave of light going through the detector. If you look a bit later, it looks like that, then like that. 
And so you, can, you don't need a computer to see where this comes from, right? So, uh, and then it eventually travels. Of course, this is all happening at the speed of light, essentially, right? So here I'll show you another illustration of this. You will see a muon come in. You see, this is the bow wave it makes. And you see the bow wave hit the sensors in the detector. And so what we get on our computer is this. So, and from that, in fact, you have to reconstruct the direction of that muon. So, uh, just to make sure you understand this picture, where I show more of them. Uh, so, if you detect one photon, if this is too technical, light comes in particles, right, at these energies. If you detect one photon, then it's a little dot. A big dot in this slide is maybe 10, 20, 30 photons. So the size of the dot tells you how much light, and the color following the rainbow tells you the direction of time. So this actually didn't come through the Earth. You see it goes yellow to green to blue. So it went down. It's one of these muons of the hundred a second that went through this table, and which uh, are just annoying in this case. So, uh, I think I've already, so we are going to build our kilometer cube big eye for neutrinos, and I already alluded to the fact that uh, this was tried in a pioneering experiment. You see, if you look carefully at this, this picture, this is the light sensors they built, look very similar to the ones we are using now. And if you look carefully, at the thing they are throwing off the boat there, you will see halfway up the structure, one of these light sensors, they are of course sitting in a pressure vessel. I cannot reach there, but I can reach here. It's this thing, right? And so they deployed one string of these and took data for 24 seconds. Then the experiment failed and they never got funding again. So, at the time they were trying this, we were uh, doing a similar experiment, and it's really the same idea, but you put the uh, light sensors in ice. Now it's clear that it's much simpler to put light sensors a mile deep in ice under the South Pole than to put it off the coast of Hawaii. And if you think this is a joke, it's not. It turns out it is much simpler. So, what about? Here is, uh, I have already told you, we found this incredibly transparent ice at the South Pole. And the other luck we have, piece of luck we had, on the left of this picture, you see the South Pole station. So there was already a research station that has this infrastructure to do this experiment. You know, it has bulldozers, cranes, places to sleep. Uh, in uh, the summer, basically you can work at the South Pole in uh, December and January. The rest of the year, like October, you can use part, uh, you can put part of November, part of February. But it's basically two months. But they managed to, to fly over 400 planes in, in these two months. And then, of course, you can bring your equipment there. The way you bring the equipment, first of all, the South Pole is where it is. I don't have to go and point at it. You see, we are sitting, the experiment is sitting in a glacier that runs off the transantarctic, the West Antarctic mountain range. So our experiment actually moves 10 meters every year. And uh, with some interesting consequences. But uh, so this is a map of Antarctica again, but at the bottom of the map you can see New Zealand. And so the way you do this experiment is it was all built in Madison. It either goes from Los Angeles by boat to a place to the bottom of. Uh, Antarctica, or it goes by plane to Christchurch in New Zealand, then by other plane to McMurdo, which is the south, the south end on this map 
of Antarctica, and then it goes by another plane to the South Pole. So, but this is a well-oiled routine that the National Science Foundation had figured out, and we could just <coughs> plug into this. So, we started deploying our first modules uh, in uh, the early 2000s, and the early 1990s, and by 2000, we had built a small detector. And the small detector consisted of 700 of these photosensors, and we placed them a mile deep under a building which, contained, which holds the electronics, which is about 800 meters of the geographic South Pole, which you see indicated on that picture. This is what the South Pole looked at the year 2000. And we did what we promised, we detected neutrinos. This is what our event display looked like in 2000. So each of these dots on the picture is a sensor. Again, sensors that detect light make uh, little dots. And you see there, from red to blue, this is a neutrino. And so we could detect neutrinos. Now you go and ask for your kilometer cube detector. In fact, a good thing happens to us. We were at the time declared one of the seven wonders of astronomy by Scientific American. But I showed this picture uh, on a very appropriate scale, but we are among friends here. We are at the bottom in the category of the weirdest telescope. But still, you take any publicity you can get when you're asking for money. Uh, it wasn't that easy, because we succeeded, the experiments in water failed. And so the question, this was also given to me by another administrator, believe it or not. All my jokes are, uh, originate from administrators. <laughs> he actually knew that I am an avid fly fisherman. And so what he meant by this picture is, that maybe we had found the most complicated way to detect neutrinos. So the people, you know, were saying there must be easier ways to do this. And, but eventually, the lack of competition and new ideas, what could they do? They gave us the money. And so we built Ice Cube, which is uh, a kilometer cube neutrino detector. And so the way this goes is this actually. So at the top of this picture, you stand 800 meters of the south, from the South Pole, where you see this little building at the top. And so you see the outlay on the ice of what we want to build. And so you go there, and by the year 2005, for instance, uh, we put in one string in 2004. A string is a kilometer long and has 60 of these sensors, 17 meters apart. Eight strings the next year, 13 strings the next year. And you see, we were slowly learning how to do this well. In fact, if we couldn't do this in six years, we'd run out of money. So from then on, we basically had to do 20 per year, and we succeeded. So to further explain this picture, so by 2011, this was all complete, and we still had money left. So this is the top view at the time. And so you see the, the red circle there, that's the building on top of it. And if you go to that building, that's a two-story building. It's filled with computers. I will explain to you why in a second. That's the inside of that building. It's racks of computers. Uh, I think I said all this. That's a picture of real life. If you count this, these are 20 cables. We managed to do, so this is late January. 20 cables were, dis, were deployed. They are connected to the sensors. The cables go into this tower and then into the building where the data is fed into the computers and analyzed. Uh, this is what the South Pole Station looks like now. It operates during the night, which is six months. And so two people stay to babysit this experiment over winter. And uh, that's the pictures they send us every week. They send us a report on the data every week. 
And then there, I promise not to show nice pictures, but this one I cannot resist. <laughs> okay. And so then you see neutrinos. You now all know what this is, right? All right. So what were the challenges in building this experiment? You must have wondered by now, how did we put these things in the ice? And that was the hardest part of the experiment. Uh, we tried engineering firms. We tried Texas oil drilling companies. We tried Madison engineering professors. We didn't get anywhere. So finally, the drill was designed and all the problems solved uh, by a group of graduate students, physicists, and some engineers working together. It was a very exciting. This is what we came up with. And uh, uh, the complicated thing is not what you're looking at. It's how you have to, to supply the fuel that by the time the process is over, everything fits in the hole. And that's a very complicated mathematics problem which one graduate student solved. We couldn't. Uh, so what you see is this is uh, the smoke is ca coming out of a, a battery of about 40 car wash heaters. So they make uh, 4.8 megawatts of heat. That's going into, you see this reel with a hose coming out, this big hose reel. It holds a two and a half kilometer hose, this big. The water is sent to it under pressure to melt the ice. So you see the hose is hanging over this tower and the tower is the drill tower. Uh, to better explain what I just said, here is a, a movie of this. So you see the drill and the hose. So you first you have a heating element that melts the snow. By the way, the snow layer is 80 meters. So that, that's not simple. But then comes this hose with a nozzle on it, and you just pump out hot water under pressure, and it falls by gravity. You don't have to do anything. The faster it falls, the smaller the hole. The slower, the bigger the hole. And then you wait, and now you have a two and a half meter hole where the water has been transformed the ice has been transformed into water. You never take the water out. You put hot water in and take the cold water out at the top. You make a loop. This takes two days only. And uh, so now you, I'll show you the next picture. This is a picture where the drill is coming out of the hole. So now you have water there. You have 60 sensors waiting right next to the hole. And then uh, you put them in one by one. So you start lowering the cable. And every 17 meters, you attach one of these sensors with carabiners, plug them in, lower by 17 meters, plug in another one, until you have instrumented a kilometer of, of cable. At the bottom, there is a 600 pound weight. And then the stuff just sinks to the bottom under the pull by the weight. Okay, so that's like the last time. You realize this is like launching satellites. This is the last time you see the equipment. It'll never come back. Uh, if this sounds easy, it's always not, not that easy. And that is not me. <laughs> okay. So, uh, second challenge. The second challenge was is to get rid of this rain of muons that falls on your detector in the wrong direction. And so I will show you, this is the detector taking data. And you see all these sensors are sending light signals to you. And then the computer at the surface reconstructs these in muon tracks. You see all these muon tracks. And in fact, if you wait six minutes, you will see one neutrino. This movie is 10 milliseconds long. So this is one hundredth of a second of data that you are looking at. And so that's really the problem. We have to look for signals. This is, I'm sorry, this is the only slide, I think, with numbers on it. But we see a hundred billion of these muons at a rate of 
2,700 per second. Actually, this is 3,000. In summer, it's 3,000. In winter, it's 2,500. We see neutrinos from the atmosphere one every six minutes, but that's still background. That's 100,000 a year. In this, we have to find 10 or 100 interesting events. And I was giving this, when I was giving this talk, people thought I was crazy. In fact, as I will tell you at the end, we have found them. Uh, launching this equipment, you know, this, this light bulb cost only $1,000, $1,100. And it works forever. We have never seen one fail. But you deploy the electronics that digitizes the signal that comes out of uh, the light sensor. And if any of this fails, you lose. It's like launching a satellite. But up to now, 99% of the detector is working. And almost all of that is uh, lost when the ice refreezes. We know why. There's nothing we can do about it. Now, one story I have to cut short here is now you have to find the optical properties of the eyes. And I have already told you how when we deployed the first sensors, we found these incredibly transparent eyes. Uh, part of our collaboration, actually, has become so carried away. We are now measuring eyes with a precision that no glaciologist has ever done before. In this picture, you see our measurement of the optics of the eyes. In fact, it basically, what this does, it maps the impurities on the eyes, the dust. There's practically none. But you see this dip, it means the eyes get very bad at this point. It's over a distance of a few millimeters. That's one volcano. So that volcano went off, I don't know, 60,000 years ago or so. I can look it up. The depth tells you when it was. And puts a little bit of dust in the atmosphere that uh, condensed with the snow and ruins our, the optics of the ice. Okay, so anyway, these were our challenges. We built this thing. And this would be my useful slide uh, because here I can tell you how to make money, or I could. There was actually a, a website on New Scientist where you could bet it says the world's biggest physics experiments, and you could bet whether uh, Amanda would detect cosmic neutrinos or not. And you would get six to one, and you would have lost your money. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider detecting the Higgs is also six to one. But LIGO detecting gravitational waves, they get 500 to one. And we all started betting on LIGO, and they took the web page down. So it's too late. But so I am a bit worried about calling the Large Hadron Collider big science because this is the, the ATLAS experiment, which is the largest ex physics experiment ever built. This is the detector. And if I scale it to ice cube, that's how big it is. OK. So. This is only partly, their experiment is better than ours. <laughs> it has a bit more detail in it. But I show this slide to, to remind that, you know, two-thirds of the collaboration are not doing what I'm talking about. They take all these neutrinos and do particle physics. In, you know, 10 years, we will, we will uh, collect a, a million neutrinos. Some of them have a thousand times higher energy than any neutrino we've ever produced at an accelerator. And I will, I will show you some of these neutrinos later. So we're coming to the end, and the critical question is, what does the neutrino sky look like? And so here is the neutrino sky. After the first year of taking data with Amanda, uh, we had never any illusion. It was always understood Amanda was R&D for Ice Cube, but still. We detect 600 neutrinos, and here is the sky. And do you see anything? What about that? That's what you're looking for. You see there's a little pileup of neutrinos. That, so that could be a star. 
Of course, it isn't. Uh, if you do the statistics, this is totally, it's an accidental accumulation. It has no meaning. And we knew that. We didn't even get excited. So we have been doing this since the year 2000. And uh, so here is the, the end of this. So I run a, Ice Cube for five years. Ice Cube has only run for three years. But I run it for five years. This is what the map will look like. And you will see supernova remnants. Now you say, how do I know this? Well, this is a simulation of the experiment. So I put them in. <laughs> I get them out. But this is what we realistically should see by the best of calculations of respectable theorists. By the way, if we can finally prove this, the first paper that suggested this was by this man's wiki. He actually had suggested it in talks before. It was published in 1934, so I think it's time to prove this. So I will, will, we will make him smile. So here is the story of the maps. They go on and on and on. And so we keep doing this without getting bored. And then something good happened. We were looking for, you don't have to know what we were looking for. We were looking for something there and then suddenly found something there that we were not looking for. And the something there is this event. This event, you see light, it travels up and down a string and then it starts to expand to the detector. You see, these strings are 125 meters apart. So it goes to the next string and to the next string. And so you say, well, that's not like anything you expected. What this is this? Where is the muon track? Well, I can show you a picture of the online event display. You see here the computer, this is the same event on a different display. And you see the computer looking for a track and it cannot decide. It keeps reconstructing in all directions. And the reason it cannot find a track is because there is no track. And in fact, you can look in other directions, there's no track either. You see how confused it is. What this is, is it's not like what you see at the bottom, it's like what you see at the top. And what it is, this picture is not very clear. You know, neutrinos come in three flavors. And so there are electron and tau neutrinos as well as muon neutrinos. So if an electron neutrino interacts inside a detector, it also makes a nuclear interaction. It makes particles and it makes blue light, but it no, doesn't make a long track. So in fact, it makes a ball of light which is about from this screen to that screen. And you say, that's big. But no, in a kilometer cube detector, that's a point of light. And that's what you see. You see this ball of light. It's totally spherical. So do we know where it comes from? Yeah, we kind of do. So here is the second event. We have found ways to actually figure out where these neutrinos come from. So it looks pretty much the same. Now, if you lost track of how, what you are looking at, I suppose you know what you're looking at here. So I couldn't resist superimposing one of these events on this picture. And uh, this is not just a joke, I mean, because, uh, because of the size of these events, you can look at not just the shape, but at the detailed time structure. I mean, this is six city blocks long, and even at the speed of light, that's a very long time. And so you can look at the time structure and actually know where these neutrinos came from. But I had a smart graduate student who immediately knows what to do. We have to find more of these events. And the way you do that is you just look for events that start inside the detector and forget these long muon tracks. And so you make sure no light comes in the detector that only light starts inside the detector and you see it come out. And you eliminate everything that comes in from the outside. And he managed to do this and we tried it on the same two years of data where we found these two events. 
and he found 26 more. And so now we are talking. By the way, I'm sorry for these events are called Bert and Ernie, and so all these other events have names of Muppets. Uh, <laughs> I have been told we have more than a hundred to go, but we are getting there soon. Uh, you can imagine there's a lot of activity at this point. Where do these events come from? That's a whole different story. Uh, this is the sky map. So now uh, I'm not an astronomer. I actually for years had no idea what I was looking at. <laughs> and now I barely know. But uh, you know, where do, these, where do you think these events come from? You can say, well, they come a bit from everywhere. In fact, the first event I showed you comes right from the center of the galaxy. Then you say, well, now I've discovered galactic accelerators. But the second one comes from nowhere. And so here about half of the events may come from the galaxy. The galaxy actually is this gray line you see going through the plot. Uh, now you say, oh, look there. Look at that blue spot right here. What's that? And that actually could be a point source of neutrinos. We don't know. And uh, I have seen maps like this for 15 years. And if you ask me, have I ever seen a map that looks like this? that if you threw in a hundred more events was completely uniform? The answer is yes. Is this going to happen here? If I had to bet my wallet, I would say probably not. But then I have very little money on, in it, so I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't bet more than my wallet on it. So this, of course, created a flurry of activity. And uh, so we had another year of data which we are now looking at, but just looking at the first few events, we found this one. And this one uh, is bigger than the two first ones, so you know what we called it. Big bird, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I could show you the events and you could come up with the names. Uh, we don't do this to be funny. If you, it's much easier when you interact with each other to remember events as, as Muppets than as numbers 1 to 28. You know, if someone says Snuffleupagus, we immediately know. <laughs> it's, a, it's an event that looks like this, but then it suddenly has a muon track coming out of it. And so that's Snuff, you know, thing. Uh, Okay, so I think uh, it's time to quit. I have to show you Two more slides. Uh, I should tell you that I have told you about less than one third of what we are doing with this experiment. And uh, these are some of the other things we are doing. You know, we are testing relativity, you know, trust but verify. Uh, we are checking relativity. Uh, in fact, the, the, what science is don't trust and verify. And so that's what we are doing. We are waiting for a supernova to explode in our galaxy, which would be the astronomical event of a century. Uh, we have been waiting already for 25 years. The last one was in 1987. And it wasn't really in our galaxy. It was in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, we are looking at solar flares. We are looking for sterile neutrinos. We are actually the best experiment for sterile neutrinos. And most of us don't care. And we look for dark matter in the top left. And then you see my computer output in the middle. And that's something I am doing. And uh, I would be ashamed if I told you what it is. So I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but if it ever works, you'll read it in the New York Times. Uh, that's the end. Thank you very much.
sure we have some questions here. If you had another event like the 1987A, what, how many detectors would go off? Yeah, it's like, it's like I remind you, 1987A detected 20 neutrinos among two, three experiments, maybe two, two mostly. It generated probably 10,000 papers from the 20 events. <laughs> so we would get uh, a million events if there were a supernova in the center of our galaxy. We would have, we, we would see the whole history. Uh, you could kind of see it on, on the, well, I can go back to the slide, there was one of the last one. You see, you would see a time sequence. And there, this, this case has a million events, and so you can see everything that happens in the supernova during the explosion and, and before. It would be uh, incredible. And now there would be other experiments that can do this too. So, uh, as I said, it would be the event of the century. If it waits a year, we would see the incapitation of waves. Also, you know that neutrinos come earlier. So we have a, a warning system. In fact, if there is a supernova, my phone would go off. But it, I turned it off, actually. <laughs> I'll, I'll check afterwards. Uh, we have a warning system because the neutrinos in 97 came four hours earlier. So you have four hours to, to alert the telescopes to point. And uh, if you could actually, we've never seen a supernova from the beginning. It was always afterwards, you know, someone sitting in their deck chair sees one and then calls an observatory. So this would be a big event. Yeah. Just a simple question. So you're dropping the uh, sensors in. What's it traveling to? Is that a vacant hole or is there water? No, no, it's in water. Why does it freeze? Oh, ice is an insulator. It takes... Uh, in fact, that's the, that was the hardest problem to solve. You have to know how to make the hole, how to supply the heat, so that when the sensors come by, the hole is just wide enough. But uh, that's, of course, because a hole takes two C-130s of jet fuel. So you want to get this right. You don't want 15 C-130s of jet fuel. We didn't have that much money. And uh, so, uh, but as ice is an insulator, this ice, uh, this, the water refreezes after, it takes hours and days. So we, we make the hole so that you have 28 hours to deploy the string. And we can do this now in less than 10 hours. So, but if you make a mistake and you hang the drill, then it makes a bigger hole locally. That stays like, it takes months to refreeze. Yeah, so it's, that's not a big problem. Any other questions? Yes. You said the ice was one of the most transparent things, more transparent than most things created in labs. Did you have to purify the water you heated then? Or did no, you because, uh, you know, if you think th this, if you think of the detector, the amount of volume that's refrozen and that may be dirty water. In fact, it is dirty because it has air in it and bubbles. And bubbles is very bad for us. So we actually wanted to know where the air went in our hole, never mind with purifying the water. So we actually have cameras in the detector where you can look at the hole while it refreezes and now, and in fact, all the bubbles, all the air, concentrate in a column in the center of the hole. But this is a small volume of ice compared to the total detector, so we pretty much can ignore this. There is something in our simulations that says hole ice, where you can actually change the, the optical properties of this column, but it's not very important. Sorry, the How far down did you find the evidence of the volcanic event? Oh, I don't know. We have several of those. And they are well known. This is not discoveries. In fact, 
At the South Pole, they've never taken ice cores. If you take an ice core, you can look what the ice looks like, right? Although they never got the optical properties right, actually. But if you look at the layering that we, we, we've mapped, if you go 1,000 kilometers away to the Vostok station, they have taken ice cores there. And we can trace everything we see to what they see in the ice cores. I mean, there's really nothing much new in it. Well, we'll figure out when we know where they come from. That's the way we're going to do this. You know, if they come f from the galaxy, from regions where stars are formed, we are seeing supernova. If they come f I mean, my guess actually is that they are partly galactic, partly extragalactic. Most astronomical maps are like that. Do those give you a trace back? Yeah. But we haven't been able to do this yet. That's what uh, this map, you know, that's what I said. It, you, you can guess where they trace back. And by the way, if you look at uh, about every three days, there is a paper saying where this comes from, <laughs> which shows you we don't know. <laughs> and so what we are doing is get more data. And in fact, I didn't go into this. But what we mostly want is more tracks, because these we can reconstruct well, and this point back to their origin much better than these blobs, which, you know, we have about a 10, 15 degree error on them. It's not very, as astronomy goes, it's not very respectable. It's just, uh, I, I think you can imagine that for years there was a bitter fight whether water was better than ice than, or not. And I think we've begun to realize that it, they're similar, very similar. They have different optical properties, but they're very similar. And uh, in the end, it doesn't matter. If the best indications are that ice actually is slightly better, but the big advantage, it turns out, that it's much easier to drill these things. I, I always say you can walk on your experiment. You cannot do this in water. It's very difficult to, to deploy stuff in water. And once our uh, sensors are deployed, nothing happens to them. They're sitting there forever and uh, ticking away like a Swiss watch. In water, they are sitting in changing temperatures, they are sitting in currents. In fact, uh, they have succeeded to build a small experiment in the Med Mediterranean. But they have to regularly service it. They have to repair strings. I mean, we, we wouldn't be able to, right? So, but it's not necessary. So it's mostly, our advances has mostly be that the, the logistics of building the thing is simpler. I, I would actually say that uh, it just repeats to the incredible achievement that uh, Ice Cube represents in the environment and the novelty of the So let's, let's thank Ice Cube. Thank you. Thanks very much.